السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف خلق الله وأعز المرسلين سيدنا ومولانا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين وصحبه الأخيار المنتجبين وعلى جميع الأنبياء والمرسلين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أما بعد يقول الله تعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وإنك لعلى خلق عظيم صدق الله العلي العظيم Quran chapter 68 verse number 4 and you are truly a man of outstanding character it is narrated that our beloved the holy prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam said أحسن الناس إيمانا أحسنهم خلقا the best people in faith are those who have the best character, the best manners of character, or khuluq. bi ahlih, and those who are kindest to their family. Wa ana altafukum bi ahli, and amongst you I am the kindest to my family. Now, we had mentioned before multiple times that the iman, the, the faith of a person, cannot be complete only at the theological level, only that you believe certain things intellectually. Iman occurs when actually this theology, these thoughts that you have, they actually transform into an internal energy and that internal energy moves you as a mu'min so that you spontaneously do good. You spontaneously avoid evil. This is really the goal. You don't have to think twice about avoiding the masiyah or the sin. You don't have to think twice about doing the wajib, doing the obligatory. This is what Iman is. Iman is a state that is internal but is actually manifesting externally. We have deliberated, we've discussed that and elaborated on it multiple times. From naqli sources, naqli meaning what? Narrations, Quran, scripture, or aqli as well, rational discussions. Rationally also, you can't say that this person has faith, but it does not show in her life. So... When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is present in your mind and in your heart, truly, then you think twice before you say any word. You're conscious of God before you say any word. You're conscious of God before any step that you take. You're conscious of God before any decision that you make in all the aspects of your life. All of them, in your personal relationships, in your personal connection and relationship with God, in your personal life, in your interaction with the environment, Every aspect. God is present. God is in the center or at the center of your mind and your heart. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of course commanded us to have husnul khuluq. Good manners of character. That's a command from Allah. Allah wants us to be like that. So if you're a mu'min, if you're a person of true faith, you actually will love to attain these characteristics. You will want to go and seek it. You want to be generous. You want to be kind. You strive for it. You work for it. You want to be a forgiving person. You want to be a person who seeks justice. The rule of law. You try to be good. You try to show mercy to people. Right? You try to resemble Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your life. And if you do good, you thank Allah for it. Today I paid charity. Alhamdulillah. I thank Allah. I show appreciation that He supported me. He helped me. He drove me to do this. If you're a truly a mu'min person, and if you do something bad, something evil, you do injustice to someone, you badmouth someone, for example, you slander, you, do, you, know, you slip, then you return to God. You ask Him for forgiveness, and you promise that you will not do it again. That's really how you demonstrate that you're a mu'min person. You like to be with God. You like to be how God likes you to be, genuinely, practically. So, then Iman for you becomes this torch that guides you to God. Your will becomes aligned with God's will. 
And if anyone from us has not reached that stage, it means that this Iman is incomplete. There is something missing there. There is a gap. This is what the Prophet is saying when he would say, Ahsanu nasi imana, the best people in faith, Ahsanuhum khuluqa, are those who display good or the best manners in their character. There is a strong connection between Iman and ethics, morality, the way you display your Iman. You can't separate them. You can't separate them. I feel this is a very important concept. And you see, maybe I hope I didn't bore you much by repeating that again and again, because it is important. It is the fruit of our faith that it should display and manifest. Inshallah, we all are supported to do that. It is narrated that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi said, you will never be able to envelop people with your wealth, but envelop them and embrace them with your good manners. No matter how wealthy you are, it's not necessarily that people will like you or love you or respect you. Not necessarily. But if you don't have wealth, if you don't have money, but have akhlaq, have good manners, it's a natural law that you'll be respected. You are able to envelop, to embrace people with your manners. Embrace them with your manners. It is narrated that our sixth Imam, Imam al Sadiq, alayhi salam, that he said, ما يقدم المؤمن على الله تعالى بعمل بعد الفرائض أحب إلى الله تعالى من أن يسع الناس بخلقه. That a believer would meet God on the Day of Judgment with nothing better than good akhlaq, than good manners after doing the fara'id or the wajibs or the obligatory actions. After that, the best thing that you could meet God with on the Day of Judgment is good manners, good akhlaq. This is why some of the recommendations of the Prophet in the month of Ramadan, what does he say? مَنْ حَسَّنَ مِنْكُمْ فِي هَذَا الشَّهْرِ خُلُقَ Whoever of you fixes his manners, his ethics, his morality, his conduct in this month, the month of Ramadan, whoever displays good manners of character in this month, you will pass safely on the sirat, on that path of heat on the Day of Judgment. Huh. Important. I'll mention a couple of stories that are really interesting and really important. I really like them. It is narrated in Amali al-Saduq. That a that Amir al Mu'minin Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam he narrates that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam owed a Jewish person, a person from the Jewish community at the time, he owed him money. What are those who accuse us that we have problems with the Jews because they're Jews? The Prophet used to have transactions with them. Someone lent him money. So the Imam Amir al-Mu'minin would say the Prophet owed a person from the Jewish community of Medina some money. One day, this person demanded his money. He came to the Prophet and said, I want my money. The Prophet would say, oh my dear brother, I don't have your money now to give you. The person would say, I'll stick, I'll stand by you, I'll stay with you until you give me my money. The Prophet said, okay. And the Prophet stayed where he was. Imam Ali continues that the Prophet prayed Dhuhr, prayed Asr. The person is still next to him. He can't let him go. The Prophet stayed praying Maghrib, praying Isha. The person is still there. Praying Fajr, time for Fajr came. The companions of the Prophet, some companions were waiting and observing, deliberating how to punish this person, started threatening that Jewish person. The Prophet would turn to his companions and, and, and he would tell them, what are you saying about this man? What are you saying to this man? They said, O Messenger of God, a Jewish person locks you up? The Prophet turns, them, turns to them and said, God never sent me to do injustice to anyone, non-Muslim or other. And when the day, the time of the day came, a few hours later, That Jewish person said to the Prophet, O oh Muhammad, I bear witness that there is no God but Allah and that you are his messenger. Wow. 
And by God, I did not do all this except to test you and see your manners of character. If they are like what the Torah describes you, O Prophet, and it describes that the last Prophet is not rude, is not harsh, is not vulgar, is not adorned with obscenity, nor does he speak dishonesty. That's our Holy Prophet. Our fourth, our fifth Imam, Imam Baqir, alayhi salam, <laughs> is narrated to have said that Amirul Mu'mineen, alayhi salam, Imam Ali, accompanied a non Muslim on a travel. That non Muslim said to Imam Ali, Where are you heading, or, or person? He said, I'm heading towards Kufa. And when they reached the place of parting ways, Imam Ali continued with that person. This person, non-Muslim, turned to Imam Ali, not knowing him. He said, O oh, servant of God, you said you're going to Kufa, right? Imam said, yes. He said, but you missed your exit. Imam said, yes, I know. Okay, how are you still accompanying me while you know you've missed your exit? Imam Ali would say, or said to this person, this is the manners of company. That a person keeps the company for a bit more before they depart. And this was the command of our Prophet. The person said, really? This is what your Prophet says? Imam Ali said, yes. And that non-Muslim said, no doubt that the ones who followed this Prophet did so for his noble character. I tell you, my religion is that which you say. This ethics, I really agree with what you are saying. He's not saying I'm Muslim, huh? by the way. He's saying that's a nice religion. That's really what I believe in truly. That's my religion, religion of manners and ethics. And Imam Bakr says that when this person returned back, he met Imam Ali again and he realized who this person was and that non-Muslim embraced Islam. Right? Good manners. So how can the khuluq become a conduct? We know that understanding that good khuluq is good is not enough, as we said. This has to transform. Of course, it is based on knowledge. It is based that on the fact that you go and learn what are the conduct, the ethics, or the morals that Allah wants us to observe and demonstrate. It's good to know, but it's not enough, not sufficient. And displaying it requires some course of action, actually, huh? to transform what you know, what you learn, what you read, what you see into action. It's, it's, a, it's a workshop, yes? requires an action plan. It is not sufficient to come and say because it's delicate. You can't say, for example, okay, look, I want to be displaying good manners and therefore what I will do, I will be forgiving. I decide from now on that I will forgive everywhere, everyone, anywhere, anytime. That's easy. That's an easy thing to say because this actually would make you fall into the trap of, well, you shouldn't really forgive the one who does injustice. Because you would be then supporting injustice. And in fact, there is a principle. There is a principle that you decide, okay, what should I do? Should I forgive at this time or should I not? And that principle that we could follow is not to be self-centered. Is not to be self-centered. What do I mean? That if a person is a killer, someone is a burglar, you say, I'll forgive. Huh? You might be saying this because it brings you peace of mind. You might think I'm being actually, what do you say, selfless. I'm being selfless, I'm forgiving. But in fact, no, you might be being selfish because it actually gives you the peace of mind and it is not beneficial to the other person. What is good to the killer and the burglar is not to let them loose, but actually is to punish them because your aim is not to just harm for the sake of harming. Your aim is to stop this person from going further into the evil, is to save that person. You want his own interest. That's why we put people in jail. That's why we show severity against injustice. If someone is oppressing some other person, you don't say, look, we want peace, let's, you know, it's okay, I won't do anything because... No, you, you put an end to it. That's how every rational person works. That's how every government works. You can't let a criminal loose because it's good for that person to reform. It's out of love, actually. It's out of mercy, actually. It does not contradict with what we talked about last week about peace and seeking peace. 
when you show strictness and when you're stern towards establishing justice, that actually establishes peace. And in fact, Imam Sajjad السلام, says, oh. And the right of the one who wrongs you. What? The one who wrongs me has a right? Yes. Every person has a right. Even if he wrongs you. Imam says the right of the person who wrongs you is that you forgive him. And if you know that forgiving him is bad for him, you would seek your right from him. You would seek justice. You would not just forgive. So the principle here is that you seek what is good for the other person, not what is motivated by your own desires, by your own impulses. Someone slandered me, I feel I have to slander back. No, that's you being selfish. Being selfless is to take a moment, think about what is good for the other person. This is how Ahlul Bayt taught us. And in fact, this goodness in character that we're talking about is a high spiritual status, to be honest. It's a high spiritual status. It's like you become a person who radiates love. When you give, you give out of love for the other person. When you withhold, you withhold out of love for the other person, not because you're stingy or miserly. When you give, not because you are someone who doesn't calculate and who squanders. No, you give knowing that I'm giving out of love. When you withhold knowing, I'm withholding out of love. Isn't this how we discipline our children? Isn't this how we discipline, let's say, pupils in any school? Sometimes you have to deprive, you have to withhold. A surgeon has to perform a surgery that might be painful. It's for the best interest of the other. That's how you decide. And therefore, you're a person who radiates love, who radiates manners, who radiates ethics from the inside, from your heart. That's why it is important that Iman is transformed from your intellectual level to your heart as energy. And then you flow, and then you radiate this energy to every people around you. Therefore, all this, my dear brothers, my dear sisters, is, um, is established by rahmatullah, on two things. First is that we train ourselves we try to acquire these attributes that make us what? Give, regardless of who or where. Have that attribute huh? of giving, of showing mercy, of showing forgiveness, of showing love, of smiling. Have these as attributes, acquire them. Try to go into fight with your, what do we call it? A nafs al-ammara with your evil commanding self. Sometimes we have an inclination to go towards what? If he slanders me, I slander back. Huh? If he gossips about me, I'll gossip back. We have that tendency. No, fight it. Fight it. Tug of war, yeah? Tug of war. Have this quality in you so that you don't judge where you're applying forgiveness. Have that first. And the second step is actually you vary how you give and how you show mercy and how you show good manners, depending on the situation. You can't say, look, I'll forgive everywhere, everyone, anywhere, whatever they do. No. Yes, you have that quality. That's the first thing, the first step. Second step is to know and calculate how to apply it correctly, when to apply it and where. And that requires wisdom. That requires practice as well. So this is how to demonstrate correct good manners. And it's important here, of course, to be aware of this ego that we have. And this is mentioned in much of our narrations as what? Jihad al-Nafs. Jihad al-Nafs. The best struggle, the best jihad that you have. Do we not know have jihad as part of our wajib? Furu' al-Din. One of the 10 furu' al-Din is jihad. What is the best form of jihad? Struggling against your own self. Jihad al-Nafs, that's what the Prophet said to people who just came from war. He said, now it's your time to do Jihad al-Nafs, that's greater. We need to be careful of this. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam said in a narration, Shall I not point you to the best manners in this world and in the next? An tasila man qata'ak that you connect with the one who disconnects from you. Not to say, oh, this person disconnects from me, it's his fault. I mean, 
I'll disconnect, so what? Huh? I have a value of myself in front of God. No, the Prophet is saying, no, you resist. You connect with the person who disconnects from him. That's not poetry, huh? That's not poetry the Prophet is talking. That, yeah, you know, be better. Yes, be better, actually. Practice it. Think about someone who disconnected from you now and go connect with them. That's how you demonstrate that the Prophet is not talking poetry to you. And to give the one who deprives you. Think now about someone who deprived you of something. Go give them. And don't rub it in their face. That, yeah, you deprived me, I'm giving to you. Don't oblige people. Huh? No, just give. You don't have to talk sometimes. Just give. Just say salamu alaikum sometimes to a person who disconnected from you. That's enough. That's enough. One time, two times, three times. وَتَعْفُوَ amman ظَلَمَكْ Someone wrongs you, you pardon, you forgive. But of course, you know how to apply this. We we'll ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he may help us, inshallah, get equipped with the good manners of character. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wal-Asri inna al-insana lafi khusr illa al-ladhina amanu wa amilu al-salihah. Wa tawasaw bil-haqqi wa tawasaw bil-sabr. من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل على محمد عبدك ورسولك وأمينك وصفيك وحبيبك وخيارتك من خلقك وحافظ سرك ومبلغ رسالاتك اللهم وصل على علي أمير المؤمنين ووصي رسول رب العالمين عبدك ووليك وأخي رسولك وحجتك على خلقك وآيتك الكبرى والنبأ العظيم وصل على الصديقة الكبرى فاطمة سيدة نساء العالمين وصل على سبطي الرحمة وإمامي الهدى الحسن والحسين سيدي شباب أهل الجنة أجمعين وصل على أئمة المسلمين علي بن الحسين ومحمد بن علي وجعفر بن محمد وموسى بن جعفر وعلي بن موسى ومحمد بن علي وعلي بن محمد والحسن بن علي والخلف الهادي المهدي حججك على عبادك وأمنائك في بلادك صلاة كثيرة دائمة عباد الله أوصيكم ونفسي بتقوى الله والورع عن محارمه My dear brothers, my dear sisters, the servants of God I enjoin myself and yourselves to observe taqwa and to stay away from what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited Amidst what is going on in Palestine obviously one of the ways to counter all this propaganda is to educate ourselves and this is what I thought to spend the rest of the time that I have today um, is to share with you, actually, some um, piece from an article published at the United Nations. You can find it on UN.org. Titled, The Palestine Question, A Brief History. It talks about the brief history or a, a history of what happened and how we reached what we reached today, actually. So, may Allah give you patience with me today. I'll be more reading. And inshallah, maybe I'll comment when I have to. So, cutting through, you know, long history of what happened in Palestine. Let me start from the late 1917, where the British forces occupied Palestine. Now, except for the Crusader inter, um, uh, Interregnum, Palestine was ruled by Arabs and then by Turks for over 1300 years almost, followed or following the Byzantine era. The population of Palestine back then, 1917 we're talking about, over 100 years ago, was mostly Semitic Arabs, both Muslim and Christian. There were also small numbers of Semitic Jews. Now this is, you know, if, if an Arab criticizes the Israel, they would be also still accused of anti-Semitism, where Arabs are actually Semitic. So I think people need to re revisit that really seriously. Both the Arabs and the Ottoman Turks accorded the Jews the right to continue to worship and to keep alive the Jewish spiritual link with Palestine. Obviously, that's a right of every person to have the right to practice their belief, practice their faith, practice their religion. That was never a problem. During the 19th century, the Ottomans authorized small settlements of Jewish immigrants from European countries where anti-Jewish discrimination was increasing. At the time of the British occupation in 1917, 
Jews formed less than a tenth of the population of Palestine. Nine tenths were Arab, both Muslims, so 80%, and Christian, around 10%. And the traditions, customs, and language of the Arab Palestinians continued uh, or constituted the predominant culture of Palestine. Now, only 30 years after, 30 years after 1917, so that's 1947, the Jewish population increased to from around 10% to 57%. I'm not going to say how and why, but it wasn't peaceful, I tell you. I'll leave that to you, inshallah. So during the First World War, Britain and its allies looked for support against Germany and its ally, the Ottoman Empire. Since some Arab leaders at the time were seeking independence from Ottoman rule, obviously, so both now they have a single enemy. So the British and the Arabs have the enemy being the Ottoman Empire. Accordingly, some understandings were reached in 1915 between um, the Sharif Hussein, I think the Sharif of Mecca, as the spokesman of the Arabs and Sir Henry McMahon, the British High Commissioner in Egypt, who negotiated for the British. Now, the sheriff demanded recognition of independence of all Ottoman Arab territories, including Palestine. Now, McMahon of the British, um, uh, of Britain, however, tried to exclude Palestine through an ambiguous reference to the extent of the areas concerned. The Arab sheriff rejected McMahon's attempt and the controversy continued until 1939 when the British government conceded that in 1917 they were, quote, not free to dispose of Palestine, end quote. In fact, there was a Sykes-Picot agreement between the French and the British in 1916 where a secret Anglo-French agreement on the recognition of Arab independence excluded the independence for Palestine and instead had specified an international administration. The future of Palestine was also the subject of separate assurances given by the British government to the World Zionist Organization. So in, 19, or in 1897, the Zionist Organization led by Theodor Herzl, um, I think there was a conference in Basel at that time, a very famous one. The Zionist Organization had declared its aim to, quote, create for the Jewish people a home in Palestine secured by public law, end quote. Under the leadership of Theodor Herzl, the organization considered areas in East Africa. I think Uganda was, was a candidate back then as a national home for Jews. Um, Argentina as sites for the Jewish national home. However, it finally decided on Palestine, claiming it is a national home on the basis of ancient Jewish links with the Holy Land. Zionist leaders worked for support from the British government, emphasizing the strategic advantage of gaining a new ally that would help guard the Suez Canal. You know that canal, it's very important, very strategic, huh? It connects the East, yeah, the Indian Ocean, through the Red Sea to the Mediterranean Sea, saving the ships having to circumnavigate all Africa to go to Europe. So it was a good strategic uh, plan for them. The British, still seeking support in their war effort, reacted favorably. Accordingly, the Foreign Secretary, Lord Balfour, addressed a letter on November the 2nd, 1917, to the World Zionist Organization. And this letter, which came to be known as the Balfour Declaration, stated that, quote, His Majesty's government views with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object. It being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country, end quote. Some Jewish communities sensing a conflict of loyalty with their own countries of citizenship opposed the Zionist plans and there were some correspondences, I'll skip these in the interest of time, to show that basically Jewish populations were against this Zionist movement at the time. Even Zionist leaders would state in uh, some memos that this was an awkward position or situation that we had. To counter the Arab protests against this new policy, the Anglo-French Declaration reiterated promises for complete independence for the Arabs. The Declaration of November 1918 assured the Arabs of, quote, the complete and definite emancipation of the Arab peoples and the establishment of national government and administrations deriving their authority from the initiative and free choice of the indigenous populations. Last paragraph. Despite the assurances made in the November Declaration, Palestine's subsequent history was to show that the wishes of the vast majority of the indigenous people of Palestine 
counted for little. Their land had been promised to another people by a foreign government which at that time held no sovereign rights over Palestine. Citing these factors, several authorities have asserted that the Balfour Declaration had no binding or legal effect beyond being a statement of the intentions of one government. I felt this is a very important aspect to actually remind ourselves of. When did the whole story start? Right? And when we say ethnic cleansing, and when we say um, mass um, expulsion of Palestinians from their lands, that's history. Not very far. It's a recent history, documented history that we need to educate ourselves about. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inshallah, that he may grant victory to every oppressed in the world, especially our brothers and sisters in Palestine and Lebanon these days. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullaha li wa lakum. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala al-Nabi. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. Allah.